So this week we are going to pick up <clears throat> in uh, the Life apps that I started several weeks, again, weeks ago. And so uh, I, hope, I hope you enjoyed your break from Life apps and you enjoyed your break from hearing me speak. Um, contrary to popular belief, I don't like to hear my own voice. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if you've missed it, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about the finance app. So I stated a few weeks how much I have enjoyed teaching this series. And uh, I hope you have the same amount of joy as I do. I, say, I shared a few weeks ago that this is, the foundation of this is in spiritual disciplines. And spiritual disciplines are boring. If you, if you just teach it from a, a lecture standpoint, and so I've tried to make this fun, I've tried to make it relevant, I've tried to make it to where we can connect in some way or another to our, our, our modern culture. And so I'm going to release part one of the finance app this week. And just like the apps on my phone, my tablet, and my watch, I can't say that I have a favorite. You may have a favorite. It could be Snapchat. It could be Instagram. It could be Facebook. It could be a myriad of different apps. But for me, I can't say that I have a favorite app on any of my devices. But I do have ones that I use most often. And I shared a few weeks ago that one, some of the ones that I use most often are my health apps. But additionally, the ones that I use the most are the finance apps. They get a lot of love from me <clears throat> on a daily basis. And so as I've stated throughout this series, applications are great tools. That's all they are. They are a great tool. It's a resource that assists us in being more productive and tracking our activity. See, they are completely limited, though, in, in relation to our personal intentionality, faithfulness, and responsiveness. Otherwise, meaning an app on your phone does you no good if it's not used. Just like any tool, a tool that is in your toolbox, if it is not used, it provides you no support. It doesn't, I mean, if you have one of the best, you know, cordless saws by whatever brand that you, you, you like the most, right? And you have that saw, you have the batteries all charged up, the blades are all sharpened and they're ready to go, and it's sitting in its case and it's looking nice and pretty, and you have to saw a board, but you pull out a handsaw. <laughs> you see, that Dewalt saw or that Makita or whatever it is, your, your favorite brand, it looks good in the box, right, Adam? But if it stays in that box, does it provide you any, any advantage or value? No. And why would somebody go pull out a manual tool when they have an automated tool? And so... When we think about applications or we think about apps, even in, in the spiritual realm, anything in the Word, if that application is not applied to our life, it provides us no value. A Bible, the Scriptures, God's Holy Word, if you will, is a resource and a tool. Okay? If I pulled out your phone and I went to it and you have a Bible app on your phone and I went and deleted your Bible app, I did not delete God's holy word from your life. If I, if I go snatch up your paper Bible, for those of you that don't have electronic Bibles, and I bring it up here, throw it in that bin and light it on fire, I am not burning God's word. I am burning leather, and it's not even real leather, it's bonded leather, which is fake. <laughs> Cardboard, plastic, parchment, eek. And it's all going to go up in flames, okay? It's not what's written that is God's holy word. It's what is revealed that is God's holy word. So understanding even the Word, even the Bible that we carry along, even, even some things that we, we hold in very high esteem and, and even precious as a precious commodity, if it sits on the coffee room table or it's never opened on your phone or your tablet or your computer, it is a worthless tool. 
And so all applications are just that they're tools. If they aren't used, they have little to no value. For many of us, the most critical apps or life apps aren't even installed in our life. We've been talking about these life apps for several weeks, that if we don't even open the Bible, then we are not installing, right? We're not installing God's app store. The Bible is his application store. It's where everything, all other apps reside. If we don't even open that, then we're not even loading the applications into our life. We're not even, we're not even exposing ourselves to those applications, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, the word of God. So our faith is being hobbled when we don't even open up the word to see what, God, what God's life applications say that pertain to us. So some of us don't even have that application loaded. And I'm not talking about the Bible app on your phone. I, I'm, I'm really talking about when, when we come to crisis, where do we go? You've heard me say this before, that when crisis hits, what's the first thing that comes out of our mouth or what's the first action we take? If the first thing that comes out of our mouth is doom and gloom and misery and woe is me, dear God. Or if the first place we go, we, we, we go to our, our social app and we begin to just spew to everyone else. If that is our very first action, then we aren't even in the game Notice what I said is that when things hit us, the very first thing we do is shut that thing below our nose and above our chin. Period. Because they're not even installed. So it's very important when we talk about this, we have to at least get it into our lives. We have to at least get to a place to where we're open to the idea We're open to understand, you know. If Jesus said in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to him and therefore, see that therefore means that all that authority he has empowered into us, then we are to go into all the world and make disciples. And for us to say, well, I need more authority, we don't know what God's word says. (laughs) He's already given it to us. Like Zay said this morning when she was exhorting We've been given the measure of faith as the size of a grain of mustard seed. Every one of us. But if we do nothing with that faith, how can we say, give me more faith? (laughs) Increase my faith. And God's saying, what are you doing with what I gave you? Over and over and throughout the scriptures, everything Jesus said, he gave us a tool. He gave us an app. He gave us something so that we can live effectively. We can live successfully. We can live abundantly. We can live eternally. And we can have many of those blessings that are set aside now in heaven. We can attain them today. We do not have to wait until we are with Jesus to be healthy. We can be healthy now. Or as healthy as our physical body will allow us to be healthy. But nevertheless, we can walk in a level of health and enjoy that today. We, we don't have to wait to, 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 to get to heaven. And, and, and if we subscribe to mansions in, in heaven, if we subscribe to gold streets and all of these, these earthly representations of our own jewels, we don't have to wait to get to heaven to have that. That's right. We can walk in that today. No, not all of us are going to be millionaires financially, but many of us are millionaires spiritually. Amen. See, we, we, we don't even realize we're a millionaire today. We are so rich in the spirit yes. today. But we look to the natural and we look at our poverty in, in the natural and we equate that to everything in God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Not the poor in finances. The poor in spirit, the humble in spirit, those who don't exalt themselves or think they're greater than anyone else, blessed are they because they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is out of Matthew chapter 5. Because the kingdom belongs to us. These are things that Jesus was telling us that belong to us today. And so when we talk about the life apps, when we talk about these things, yes, they're kind of cute and they're kind of cute cliches that I've attached to them, 
but there's real practical purposes and practical things behind them if we would just grab a hold of them. I mean, I'm crazy enough to believe that if God said, I will be healed, I will be healed. I'm crazy enough to believe that if I speak it in faith, it will happen. I'm crazy enough to believe. Whether I see it or not, I'm still crazy enough to believe that it's going to happen. I don't know any better. For as smart as I am, I'm stupid in the faith. And when I say stupid in the faith, I don't mean that I don't understand. It means I'm stupid enough to believe that when the word says this, I'm going to do it and it's going to happen. God is not a man that he should lie. And so moving into this week, how many of you have ever used cash to buy something? Do y'all, some of y'all, do you even know what cash looks like these days? (laughs) How many of you have ever used a check from a checkbook? How many of you know what a check is? So when, when all three of our kids were, were in high school, you know, we, they, they, they had some inheritance money that, that her grandfather had set aside and, and uh, had come in. And so we went and opened checking accounts and savings accounts for them. And, uh, and this was before the debit cards. So it shows you a little bit how long it is. I mean, not everyone had debit cards at the time. And so I remember the first time, even now, when, when the three of our kids have to write a check, they go, how do you write a check? <laughs> how many of y'all were in school and you actually had a class that, taught you how to write checks. Okay, that just showed everybody's age. (laughs) We were taught how to write checks because that was one of the forms and methods of barter at the time. But today you say check, and the only check that most people can identify with is if they happen to still get a paper paycheck. How many of y'all still get paper paychecks? If you get paid in cash, please don't raise your hand. That's a whole nother, whole nother thing. So you still get a paper check that you have to take care of, right? How many of y'all have direct deposit? <laughs> so then we get into a little more modern. How many of us have debit cards and credit cards? How many of us wish we didn't have any credit cards? <laughs> how, many, how many of us use the, any of the online or mobile apps, money apps? It starts to get a little less and a little less as we move on. It's a little history. Long before monetary currency, monetary currency, I don't have my wallet. (laughs) Monetary currency is that green stuff or silver stuff. What is it? Oh, yeah, it looks like this for those of you that have never seen it before. Okay? Looks like this. It's green, has dead presidents on the front, has some kind of nice monument on the back. Um, it It has those... Those three little words that people hate and want to destroy, or four little words called in God we trust. You know, all that good stuff, okay? Before that existed, or any form like that in any country or system around, before it was established as an official state, and when I say state, I don't mean the state of Texas. State is meaning a governance or a citizenship. Before it was established as that type of bartering tool, people would use goods and services to transact for their other goods and services. If you read any of the, the, the patriarchs in the faith, Wesley and, and Calvin and, and Spurgeon, if you read a lot of their documentaries and their, bio, and their biographies, you'll see that many of them, when they would go preach, their offerings came in chickens. It came in goods and services with things that they maybe could use or couldn't use. Are people wanting to do something for them to show their gratitude for, 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 the, for, for being a man or woman in the faith? So long before a monetary currency was established, people would use their goods and their services to transact for other goods and services. If I wanted to get food from a farmer because I didn't farm, I would have to provide the farmer with something of value in exchange for the food that he grew. So hopefully, hopefully... I possessed some type of skill or trade or I was willing to serve the farmer in some capacity in order for me to feed my family. During the early pioneering days and and, and, uh, colonization of our own country, people wanted to leave the country that they were at and they wanted to bring their families. And so they would sign a contract 
called indentured servitude. Meaning that whoever brought them over, they would work for that person in goods or services or labor for a period of time. And once that time or a certain amount, whether it be gold or silver, was attained, then they would be released from that servanthood. Okay? And so there are times when if you were willing to serve a farmer in some capacity, then you were able to feed your family. Some farmers had enough land that they would actually give you a parcel of land that you would farm, you would learn how to farm, you would work with the farmer, but you would take care of your own part of land. Uh, So whatever percentage that the farmer was going to sell, you would sell a percentage of yours, and then a percentage would go back to the farmer to pay for the, the land that you were owning, and what was left, you would have to use to feed your family, and you would have to use it to provide seed for the next harvest season. And over a period of time, once you satisfied the obligation, you got to keep that land. It was yours. See, this was also not limited to just getting food. It also applied to getting supplies for for our trades or for our skills or maybe even improving the quality of wellness and life for our families. You know, it's not unreasonable to expect your children and your spouse to have clothes on their back, shoes on their feet, a roof over their head, and food in their belly. It's not unreasonable, right, to have nice clothes, nice shoes, a nice roof, and a steak every now and then. See, those things are not unreasonable to have. And so in this system, it's set up so that way we can attain to the level of investment that we apply. You notice what I said. We can attain to the level of investment that we apply. If I have an acre of land that I can farm, but I only, if I only take care of 1% of that, then I can only expect how much of a return, however much 1% can produce. And I'm leaving the other 99% unworked, unused. And so if I'm only willing, notice the word, willing, if I'm only willing to invest time, energy, talent, skill, whatever it is, into 1% of that, of that <laughs> land, then the best that I can, re- I can expect is the maximum that that land is able to produce at any given time. But I can increase that when I increase the scope of my investment. See, so not much has changed since early man did transactions with goods and services. Today we work to produce goods or, or provide services either for ourselves as independent business owners or for a company that we may work for. And when we work for this company, there's an expectation that we would do a certain job, a certain amount of hours in a certain way, a certain quality level. And when that happens, then we would be paid. And here in the U.S., we get paid in those green things called dollars. Then those dollars can be used to buy other goods and services. I know y'all are looking at me like, we already know this, but maybe you don't. (laughs) Maybe you don't understand the gravity of where we're going. So then these dollars can be used to buy other goods and services. Today, for most of us, we rarely actually see dollars being transacted. Now, what I have noticed, particularly in this community, there seems to be a lot more dollar transactions than in other communities that we have been in. I have my theories on that. But for the most of us, it's rare to see actual dollars transact. Unless you happen to be in the bank when someone is making a cash deposit or a cash withdrawal or someone goes to an ATM and you see them pull money out or you go to an ATM, it's rare that we actually see that money. Some people, mostly the more mature crowd as we have already identified, still use cash for just about anything. Many will still give by check. You know how I know? Because we still get checks in the offering basket. Although... Although we get checks and cash in the offering basket, for our church, we have between 50 and 60 plus percent who give online. The net average in our nation is between 35 and 45 percent. And so contrary to popular belief, maybe, we we are actually more in tune to a technical age than many other churches even of our size. So some people will still prefer to pay by check, or here's a word that you may not have heard in a long time unless you are of a certain matured age limit. Um, It used to be called a bank draft 
or a bank note. Who remembers that? Okay, what's sad is I'm, I'm, I'm actually old enough, if not young enough, to still remember that. This is where you would put your cash, and either by physically going to a bank, a building, there where they housed money, which really your money's not there, okay, just saying. It's been loaned out to other people's money, and, but that's a whole other story. Right? And so you would take your employer's bank draft, those of you that said you still get a salary check, or check, that's what it's called, or for some of us, we electronically deposit it, and when we write a check, the bank will draft, or draw, or a word that we use, withdraw, that amount from that check, and pay to a receiver's bank where they have their money deposited. And most of this actually happens without a real person logging around bags of money from bank to bank, from bank to vendor, from ben- vendor to bank. Can you imagine that? Think about this for a moment. If, if our monetary system was bricks, right? And let's say each brick weighed approximately three and a half pounds. Each brick is worth equivalent to a single dollar. And I decide to start a bank. And I have 100 bricks. And I have my 100 bricks stored in my closet that are worth $100. Anna comes to me and she says, hey, James, I have 25 bricks that I want to store. Can I store them in your place? Sure, bring those over. Right? And then Glenn says, hey, James, I have 250 bricks that I want to store in your bank. Oh, yeah, bring those over. Gabby hit the lot- lottery, and so she's going to bring over a million bricks. Well, guess what? My little place cannot hold a million bricks. And so I'm going to take some of Glenn's bricks, I'm going to take some of Anna's bricks, and I'm going to take some of Gabby's bricks, and I'm going to go build a bigger building. But each one of them still have their set number of bricks. And Gabby says, you know what? I want to buy a car. Well, actually, we're talking kind of archaic. So she wants to buy a horse and buggy, right? Her horse and buggy is going to cost this. She decides she's going to get married. That's not a prophetic word. Uh, She decides she's going to get married, you know, and so she wants to set aside a certain amount, you know. And and so she says, all right, James, I need 50,000 of my bricks. Okay, and she says, and I want them. And I'll tell her, I said, you know what? Instead of you taking your 50,000 bricks out of my building, how about I go talk to these people and I tell them I guarantee that I will give them your 50,000 bricks if they just keep it in my bank. And now I just expand all of this. And then Alfred says, hey, James, you know, I'm kind of tight. I want to I wanna buy a house for my family and buy, buy a parcel of land. Well, how much is that going to be? I said, dude, it's going to be, it's going to be 100,000 bricks. He says, I, I just don't got it. I go, what do you have? He says, well, I'll use my house and my land for collateral. And so now I'll go to the people that he's buying it from, and I say, hey, I understand Alfred wants to pay you 100,000 bricks for this land and stuff. He says, I tell you what, how about you keep those 100,000 bricks in my building? And when you need them, they're there for you. See, This is how the process began because no one in their right mind wants to lug around a basket full of bricks. And so this is is the cash process that that nobody wants to lug around money from places. Imagine the employment records that we would have to hold for a bank if we were constantly doing a manual transaction in cash. So for us, technology has simplified this and simplified it very well. It began with the advent of the automated check or draft. Those bankers, you know what I'm talking about. Or the debit check or card. Or card. Yeah, debit check or card. Credit cards, charge accounts, loans, and other means of transactions that precede debit card. But we're not going to talk, talk about those right now for this teaching. And so those automated checks are called ACH. Have you all ever looked at your bank, card, bank statement and you see ACH? And you go, what is ACH? It's the same as if you wrote a check. But instead of you physically writing a check, you tell this company, hey, let me give you my bank routing number. Let me give you my bank account number. And just what I said, I'm going to promise to pay you. But do you realize that money never changes hands? Actual cash never changes hands. Because it's electronic. It's automated. And debit cards have all but replaced most cash or checks. An ACH will automate draft. 
And this is where you provide all that information I said. A debit and check card functions much the same as a credit, except for without having an advanced line of credit, which that's what I was advancing to these guys. Then they would have to charge based upon what is actually in their account. If you have 100 bricks in your account and you want to buy something for 200 bricks, you cannot do that. You can only buy up to how many? 100 bricks. Surprisingly, we have come across places, Becky and I, in this modern age that will not accept cash or check. Have any of y'all run across places that refuse to accept cash and don't accept checks? They only want either an ACH or a debit or credit card. That's it. No other method of payment. In the past, you would track your available cash, deposit, and expense either by memory or by ledger. Now, in that little scenario, I only had five to seven customers, and I can track them. But imagine having 1,000 customers or 100 customers or 100 vendors. It's a lot harder to track your cash, your deposit, and your expenses by memory alone. So you'll have to use a ledger. If you earn good money and you make a lot of purchases, then you might need a big ledger. See, checkbooks have a ledger, which we call a register, where we write down all our deposits and expenses, and we maintain a running balance. Do not raise your hand, but at this very moment, do you know exactly what your account balances are? In addition, do you know what your net worth is? Your account balances is the actual amount of cash equivalent that you hold in any given account. Your net worth is all of your assets, your cash on hand or your cash equivalent, minus all of your debt, and that number is your net worth. For many of us, that number is red and bleeding. It's rarely in the black. But today, all of these financial processes, every single one of them, and the transactions all can be managed by some type of financial application. Every one of them. You don't have to use a checkbook register if you don't want to. Or some of us may be really old school and have the green tab books. Y'all don't, okay, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Only a few of you know what I'm talking about. They got green background. They have green lines, horizontal, vertical lines. And then they have these red lines and they have, you know, debit, credit, balance. And you put it in. Okay, y'all just really don't know what I'm talking about. I can say this. Ledgers were the first spreadsheets. Okay, the first spreadsheets. That's exactly where the spreadsheet came from. And so financial applications have come about to make all of these processes very seamless. How many of you have heard the application called Quicken? Or the application called QuickBooks, which is primarily used for businesses, small businesses. There used to be ones called Microsoft Money. Now, John may be the only, <laughs> John may be the only other one that knows about Microsoft Money. It's that old. Or here's another one, John, Money Counts. <laughs> See, so I know something that John doesn't know, which is rare. <clears throat> and there's all kinds of other ones, either third party or, or free ones or, or whatever, that are out there that perform very similar functions. Many of these started out as desktop and computer applications where you, would, you could maintain your checkbook register electronically and you wouldn't have to do it manually. This was before the internet age, or if you remember, there was this thing called dial-up modem. Who knows about dial-up modem? Okay, good. Half the crowd, which are all my age. Um, <laughs> and if you, were, if you were fortunate to have dial-up modem, you know, it would go, shh, ding, 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 shh, you got mail. Oh, sorry. Okay, only three of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> then you could actually perform some functions. But most of it you could do electronically and never have to write down again. Over time, even these computer applications become, became more versatile by allowing us to either download our bank transactions to a file that is imported. That's how I used to do it. I would download a file. Now, this was before there was a common you know, file type called Quicken or QuickBooks. And so you would download it to an Excel spreadsheet. Or back then, it was called Lotus 123. It preceded Excel. Anyone know what Lotus? Okay, never mind. I'm really showing my age. Um, <laughs> Y'all got to stop raising your hand because it's really showing my age. No. And so you would download it to that. You'd have to massage it. And then you can, you can, and I don't mean like rub it or anything. You have to change the data to make sure that it can be imported a certain way, right? Now, applications will log in directly to your bank account. 
You bring it up, you tell it your bank account, Capital One, Frost, Prosperity. You give it your username and your password, and it goes out to your bank account as if you were logging in yourself, and it will download all of your information. The application will log, will log in. It'll synchronize everything. So if you write a check yesterday, it will show up on your bank account in your automated account today. The Quicken and QuickBooks apps are even pretty good that they will remember your past transactions. If you are an avid shopper, you pray that your husband doesn't have that application because you don't want it to pop up and remember every time you go to Buckle. You know what I noticed? I noticed all of, all of the women that understand what buckle, they did this. <sighs> they didn't say a thing. They didn't say nothing. They're just kind of looking around because they know what I'm talking about, okay? <clears throat> but these apps are really good at remembering past transactions. Not only that, they can even predict based upon who you, who you spent money to, they can predict what category it is. They can tell if it was another banking institution. They can tell if it was a security agency. They can tell if it was a cable provider. And they will tell you, we believe that Time Warner is cable and internet. And you look at it and go, man, you're so smart. Yes, add. <laughs> and the next one comes up and says, oh, look, you have three transactions to buckle. We believe this is clothing. You want to add? No. Note to self. Yell at Becky. No. <laughs> But it predicts the expense category. And here's one of my favorite ones. It will reconcile your bank account on the fly. Who still does paper reconciliation? You know, you pull... <laughs> Terry goes. <laughs> you know, you have your bank account. You got your ending balance. You got all your deposits, all your expenses. You list them all out and hope that you didn't miss a check. And everything comes to a balance of zero at the end because it balances... That's the reason I don't do manual reconciliations anymore. I like the automated ones because if I can't find $3.25, I go up to a little bar called search and I go $3.25. And it gives me all of the transactions that were $3.25 and I go, oh, that's where she went. That's why she didn't give me the receipt. No, just joking. Kind of. <laughs> if that wasn't convenient enough, now all of these applications are mobile. All of these applications are mobile. Think about for a moment how many of these applications that you use. Well, let me share. Let's see. I have mine categorized in several different places. I have my banking apps for Frost, Chase, Capital One, PayPal, my Credit Karma score. <laughs> Got to know what my credit rate is. Zelle, Quicken. And then in my business area, I have QuickBooks, I have PayPal Business, I have Flint, I have um, Square, I have um, Venmo. Anybody know what Venmo is? Okay. And there are a bunch of other ones. Because I also have one called Investing. And so I have my Coinbase. Anybody know what Crypto Coin is? Okay. Some of you, I, I got that. Actually, I have two apps with CryptoCoin. And I have one called Robinhood, which helps me do investments. And I have another one called Acorns. All of those are financial applications of some point, of some type. You notice I said that I have both Quicken and QuickBooks applications, one for personal and one for business banking. And I have multiple accounts in my QuickBooks ones that I, that I manage. Not all of them are mine personally, but because I oversee several different business types, I, can, I have a QuickBooks account for each one. And at any time, I can pull it up. Combine that with all of my credit card tracking applications, my investment applications, and all my individual paying applications. Yes, individual paying applications are financial applications for my truck, my Verizon bill, my internet and cable provider, my insurance carrier, and the list goes on and on. There is an app for that. And what's amazing, if you're a geek like me, they all interconnect one with another. If I pay a bill over here, it shows up on my account. If I deposit money here, it shows up on my account. I love it. And I don't have to be sitting in front of my desktop anymore. I can be anywhere in the world as long as I have connection and I can go to any of my accounts to see what is going on. 
I was traveling one time in another country and I forgot to tell them that I was going to be in another country. And so they flagged my card. Well, the first thing I thought is, whoa, what's going on? So I pull up my account thinking, what did she spend that on that I don't have anything in my account? And there's money in the accounts. Okay, so what's the problem? And then I get a little notification. Uh, we have a charge from uh, you being in Kenya. Are you in Kenya? <laughs> yes. Can you release that? Because I have to pay my hotel bill. So all of these connect. See, I even have apps like the one Venmo and Square where I can send money to people. I don't even have to give cash to anyone. As a matter of fact, our daughter last night, a little sneaky girl she is, she brings her boyfriend to the game, and she, and she says, I have to buy Matt a ticket because Chris can get, the, get us tickets. And she goes, do they take cash or do they take cards? And we're like, we don't know. We don't have to buy tickets, you know. We haven't had to buy tickets for four years. And she goes, well, I don't have any cash. She looks at mom. You have cash? Becky's like, yes. She goes, she goes yes. She goes, well, I don't carry cash. And so she goes, all I have is a $20 bill, right? And so $20, she goes and buys a ticket, and we're trying to tell us, like, look, why are we buying the ticket? He's not my boyfriend. <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to invite my boyfriend, I'm going to pay for him. <laughs> okay, that didn't come out right. <laughs> so later on that, that evening, we were kind of fussing at her, say, uh, quanto dinero, please. We want it now. And, and she's, she looks at Becky and goes, you know what Venmo is? And Becky's like, and she goes, you don't know what Venmo is. Becky knows now what Venmo is. And so Brittany pulls it up and she sends me, she goes, it's there. Never, we never even left to go get cash, never went to an ATM. We, we were still in the stadium and bing, there's my $10. I love it. Here's one of the coolest apps that I have. And it's, it's an app that I've been, I have been uh, researching so because these things, and John can understand, we get a lot of emails from different companies that want us to test and try their application, particularly since I have a consulting business. And so I'll go and pull them up, and I'll I'll create an account, I'll look at it, and it's like, eh, it's good, whatever, I'll I'll delete it, I'll put it in my, go back and check it later, if I really like the concept behind it. And then there's others like, delete and don't ever let it load it back on your machine, right? And so this one is called Acorns. And so a few years ago it came out, and the idea behind this is, that you can begin investing in mutual funds and stocks with very little money. Okay, it costs a lot of money to invest in stocks, and and a lot of times you have to have a certain threshold that you invest in, and then there's all kinds of brokerage fees and everything like that. And so I've been watching this, this thing and reading a lot of good reports on it. And so I'm like, okay, you know, I don't make a lot of money, but we're talking, you know, a little bit of money. And so this app, specifically is a set and forget app. So all I have to do is set it on what what I want to invest and forget it. And it does all the rest. And what's really cool is I can invest just a little bit of money, you know, a couple bucks every week. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) A couple bucks every week. And over time, it tells me what my projected is going to be when I'm 62, 70, 80, 90, and 120. Yes, I plan on living that long. (laughs) But it has a really neat feature that you can reward yourself for your spending habits. You know, so every time you swipe that debit card, it has this feature called Roundup. And so if I swipe for $3.92, it will round up $0.08, and it'll invest it for me. Well, when you have two people that are charging, you know, gas here, this there, you know, in, in, in our bills, it rounds up. In eight weeks, this, this, is, just, this is how little money that, that, that I put in there. But in eight weeks, yeah, 10 weeks actually. In 10 weeks, it's already invested over $300 in little tiny roundups. $300, I don't even miss. I don't even miss it at all because it's 20 cents here, 8 cents there. It's money that I would probably spend everywhere else. But in 10 weeks, it's already got up to $300 of little tiny investment. Why are you looking at me crazy like that? (laughs) And that doesn't, 
And that doesn't include, that doesn't include what I've already set as a reoccurring investment. That's just in addition to. And so it's a little bit of money. It's not, it's not big money. You know what I mean? It's a little. But in 10 weeks, it's $300. In 20 weeks, it's $600. In 60 weeks, a little more than a year, it's how much? It's almost $1,000. In a year, just a little bit of money that I'm putting away that I don't even miss and I don't even realize that it's leaving. We'll talk more about that later on. Like all of the apps we discuss in this series, each one of them requires us to be intentional. Each one inc- requires us to be actively participating to bring about the best opportunity for success in whatever life area the app is intended for. Going back to the scripture, if we don't read the scripture and know what, how we're supposed to walk in health, then we will never walk in health. If we don't read the scripture and understand everything that Jesus completed and finished on the cross for us, then we won't walk in everything that he finished and completed on the cross for us because we have no knowledge of it. It, We we won't walk in the things that he said that we could walk in in this life if we don't ever open them up and we be intentional about it. Jesus has given us the best opportunity to succeed in this life now. The heart app, as we talked about, helps us succeed in worship. The battle app, succeed in our our prayer life. The privacy app, in our quiet and lone time with God. The selfie app, in our reflection and meditation until we see the image of Christ in us. And the health app, which is our faithfulness. See, the one key ingredient to effectiveness and value of any financial app is what? The one key ingredient to the effectiveness and value of any financial app is what? Key ingredient. Money. (laughs) You notice you said that. (laughs) Money. The number one key ingredient to the effectiveness of any financial app is money. You have to have money or the financial app, really. Yes, you can load it, but if you have no money to put into it or to track, what good is the financial app? And I know some of us are saying, well, that's why I don't have the app. Well, that's why we're having this conversation. Because there is no reason why God's people should not be without money. And I'm not talking about prosperity. I'm not talking about this this ultra hyper uh, faith. That's not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about pragmatic, realistic, walking in the faith of Jesus Christ where we walk abundantly, we walk successfully, and we walk prosperously in order to walk and fulfill the kingdom goal and the kingdom will of God. It looks different for you than it does for me. Okay? But the fact remains that in order to be effective in God's financial app, we have to deal with money. We have to have money. If we aren't intentionally and actively earning money, giving money, and saving money, none of these apps will have the ability to do it for us. You see, yes, I can set and forget that Acorns app to do it, but I had to set it and forget it. If I go out there and continually try to change and manipulate and, and do whatever, I'm going to mess it up. Set it and forget it and be, be confident and faithful in what God had given you and watch the return happen. Okay? And so we have to be intentional and active in earning money and giving money and saving money. None of these apps have that ability. They are only capable of providing a tool a tool to transact, and a tool to measure our financial stewardship and health. I can tell you this, when when early on in our marriage, that financial app called Quicken was the worst app that Becky ever wanted me to bring up. Because it would never fail when you're young and you're not bringing in a lot of money and you're watching the money all the time, things get a little tense. Do you know that we spent $340 this month on going out to eat? No. Did you know that we spent half that in groceries? Did you know we spend $300 on gas? Where are we driving to? Maybe we should walk more often. Did you know we have five credit cards, three loans, all to the amount of X amount of dollars that we're paying out? And once everything's said and done, we're paying out 
20 to 30% more than what we're bringing in. And we wonder why we don't have it. I said young, remember? Young. We were young. Yes, we were young once. Never mind the gray hair. And so that sometimes this particular app can cause tension. Because for me, who is very analytical and logical, when I see that we're spending more than we're bringing in, something tells me we need to stop it. And stop it is equivalent to a two-letter word that most women don't like to hear. No! And so I try to use other words other than no, but no is inevitable. Because if I use another word, she goes, so you mean no. No, I meant, she goes, you meant no. No, I want, I, just, just say no. No. See, these apps can't do anything for us to impact our financial ability. Unless, unless we are the creator, the designer, and the developer of the financial app, then it's not earning a single penny of money for us. So it's just a tool. The very first step to the financial app is earning finances. And so if the team can bring up that next slide. So we're going to talk about eggs. Huh? I'm teaching. I can use my latitude here. So we're going, to, we're going to talk about eggs. Eggs are the fundamental foundational areas in God's financial app. Okay? But I'm not talking about, as you can tell, the brown or white oblong items that hens lay, which we love to eat with bacon, sausage, or chorizo. Eggs. Earning giving and saving. Earning, giving, and saving is God's financial application. It's God's financial plan for success. It's God's financial plan for obedience and worship. It's God's financial plan for us to live and function in this earth. You could have said amen. So we're just going to intro earning this morning. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I know that was a long introduction, but I wanted to really set the tone for where we are going over the next, next two weeks for sure. 2 Thessalonians 3, chapter 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we are not, we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anything, anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might, be, might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. I'm going to say that again. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. <laughs> so, have you ever heard money makes the world go around? Do you know that is a false statement? Because actually, money has absolutely nothing to do with the earth spinning on its axis. Money has nothing to do with the earth revolving around the sun. Money has absolutely nothing to do with any impact on our universe. Period. So when next time someone says money makes the world go around, tell them no, it's love. And not the love of money. Money is only good here on earth. And if we don't have any, then it's going to be a very tough, rough life. That's a fact. Okay? For anyone to think that we can function like we should in this life here on earth, in Christ Jesus, absent of money, then we have a problem. Because I guarantee if you go tell your renter or your mortgage uh, lender, um, don't got any money today to pay you, but be blessed. Jesus loves you. <laughs> I'm a Christian, and uh, 
yeah, you know that $1,000 I put on your buckle card? Um, yeah, Jesus loves you. He, he's going to pay that for me. See, it doesn't function that way. And I'm sure they would tell you that um, Jesus didn't make this debt, <laughs> so I'm not going to collect from him. See, we must have money in this life, and money is not free. For that matter, nothing in this life is free. That is a saying that you can trust. It, everything costs something. See, that goes for even, even social programs. And I, I, I'm not coming against them. I'm not for them. I'm, this is not a good. This is not an evil. This is a fact. Y'all should know that by now that I state only facts. See, that goes for any type of social system, whether it's welfare, food stamps, WICs, or any other type of government social program. It still costs someone money. When you earn in this nation, coming out of your check is a thing called taxes. Taxes go to the government, and the government distrib distributes that money for all of its programs that we, as its constituents, have elected officials to go represent us in Washington to make these laws. You see how that works. So we are all in this together, number one. But the point is, someone has to pay. That means someone has to earn. So it doesn't matter who we are as a citizen in this country. It is a fact. The only way to survive is we must be able to earn money. Now, I'm not going to delve into that good and bad, like I said, but nothing is free. There is always a cost. What it boils down to is this. If we aren't earning money, then we can't even begin to experience any benefit or blessing in God's financial app in our lives. It starts with earning. If I go to Wiley and I take $100 out of his wallet and I go spend that $100 on me, I've not earned that money. I'm a, th I'm a thief. If I try to go to the grocery store and I don't have any money and I go start pulling stuff off the shelf and put it in my cart and take it to my truck and load up my truck and drive off, I am a thief. Okay? And so understanding that what it boils down to is to that one thing, that if we are not earning it, but we are spending it, then we are no more than a thief. Okay? We can't experience God's benefit or blessing in this life if we don't. If we don't provide some type of labor to produce goods or services, we won't earn any money to buy or enjoy other goods or services. Proverbs 19 and 15, slothfulness cast into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. If we don't work, we don't eat. See, doing nothing produces nothing. And even worse, doing nothing destroys and robs us of participating in God's divine plan to prosper, be in health, and experience his abundant living. We have to do some. Earning money only comes through doing honest work and laboring in excellence. People won't pay us to do nothing. How many business owners are out here? How many managers or supervisors? And you would, you would hire a person to sit on their backside and you would pay them a day's wage. No. <clears throat> no one with any good business sense could do that because you wouldn't be in business for very long unless you are just independently wealthy and you just want to be benevolent like that. But I don't know a boss who is. See, people won't pay us to do nothing. They expect us to invest our talent, our skill, our resources to provide goods and services so we can earn money. If we aren't laboring in excellence, then we are no more than a thief and a robber. If, if we go to the job and we're not meeting the expectation of, the, of what our boss has asked us to meet, and we continue to cash our paycheck, we are a thief. And you know how I can say that? I actually had conversations with people like that that worked for me. They would go two or three days, they would log into their phone, and we would have a very high queue. If, if y'all didn't know, I, I managed call centers for a while. We would have a very high queue, and they would go from log in, log out. Log in, log out. And they would do this all day long. Take a call when the volume dropped, because they might or may or may not get a call. As soon as volume picked back up, log out, log in, log out, log in, you know. And they do that all day. In three days, 
they should potentially take anywhere between 25 to 75 calls. But they only have about 12 calls. And each one of those calls is about three to four minutes. Something doesn't add up. So I have a conversation with them. I said, what's going on in all these hours that you were idle, but yet you weren't taking calls, and our call volume is saturated, and all your peers are taking calls? I don't understand. And, and then, you know, then the excuses come and, and everything else that comes up. And I, and I say, eh, just stop it. I said, Let's, let me put it even blunter to you. You do this again, you're, you're stealing from me, and I will fire you. Period. Can you imagine if God had that conversation with us? Oh, you want me to bless you? You want me to heal you? You want me to give you a new car? You want me to give you a new house? You, you want me to do all of these things for you? You're, you're praying for this, you're praying for that. And he says, mm, when was the last time you gave tithes or offerings? Right. When was the last time you were benevolent and gave a gift to someone, someone else who was in need? Man, if God was a boss like me, a shrewd boss, he'd look each one of us in the eye and say, Michael Montoya, you're fired. That grace that I gave you for free, buddy, I'm tired of you taking advantage of it. You're done. Can you imagine? Just be glad I'm not God. <clears throat> hey, you watch it there, buddy. <laughs> Ephesians 4 and 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, work heartily, heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Throughout the scriptures, and these are only just a few, God continues to encourage us to labor and to labor faithfully, to labor, to labor with all our hearts. I'm going to close with this one story. One of the very few things that, that I know for a fact that I can glean from my, my father, who is not a spiritual person, he is not a believer, but you've heard me say before that I believe that that man was more prophetic in certain things than I've ever heard any believer tell me. And one of the things that he taught me was to work hard. That if you want something, you have to work for it. Even as, as a teenager. I remember one morning... He woke me up early in the morning. We drove several hours away. I'm still half asleep. He goes and talks to a man. He hands the guy $150. He walks back to the car, and he's, to the truck, and he says, take that car home. I'm like, okay. I crawl over there, get over to the car. I'm going. He knocks on the window and says, oh, it only goes into low and reverse. We were about four hours away, so he got home in four hours. It took me almost eight to get home. So I'm driving the 67 Chevy Impala, four-door, 287, four-barrel carburetor. Um, <clears throat> nice white air conditioner, still cooled. Yeah, that was my first car. And uh, I pull it up into the driveway, and I'm steaming mad. Oh, I'm mad. I had other plans for Saturday. My dad's plans were to ruin my life. And so I get out, and I'm stomping up the driveway. He walks up to me, and he says, here. He hands me a Chilton manual for a 67 Chevy Impala. And he says, when you get over yourself, we'll fix it together. And we did. We repaired every car. This is why I take my car to the garage and have somebody else do it, because I'm not going to get under there. I hate getting dirty. I hate getting greasy. That's why I will call you to come fix something if you can fix it and not me. I don't like to sweat. I don't like to be dirty. Yes, I'm a prima donna. <laughs> <clears throat> Throw 28 degree temperatures and a little bit of rain or snow in the mix, I'm done. I will put on my pajamas and go to bed. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a work ethic that my dad was teaching me. If you want something, I wanted a car. And the only way I could get a car was to put some sweat equity into that car. And, uh, and when... And when, and when it was all done... Hey, there was music. I got to dance. When it was all done, right... Man, the paint was oxidized on that thing. You couldn't walk up against it without getting white all over you, you know. But the, the interior was pristine. Not a cut or, or a crack or anywhere on the inside. And I told you the air conditioner was, was cool. Man, and that thing would go. Man, it would go so fast. Man, I was so proud of that car. Why? Why? I had to endure pain and I had to make an investment. 
and I could drive around and I didn't, I wasn't like some people when daddy and mommy went and bought them a, a new car from the dealership that they would wreck, they would go get tickets and daddy would go buy them another new car from the dealership. No, I was under that car. I, I, I had busted knuckles. I had bleeding arms and grease everywhere. I, I had to put something into that car and I, I, I loved that car, not because it was a great car, but because of what I invested in that car. I was no longer walking. I was now one of the cool guys because I had a car. Well, guess what? That car did not run on air. That car needed tires. That car needed oil changes. That car needed some things. Well, my dad said, um, I helped you here. Anything else is on you. So guess what 16-year-old James Miller needed to think about? I needed to go think about jobs. So my first job is I went and, and, and started delivering papers for the Clean Daily Herald. And I had one route, and I did really good at that route. I made several hundred dollars. They said, hey, do you want another route? Sure. So I took that route, and I'm like, you know what? Delivering papers isn't that bad. Get up in the morning, throw the papers out, rest of my day's done. So I contacted the Austin American Statesman. I said, hey, do you need a delivery? He said, as a matter of fact, we do. And guess what? The same area that I lived that I was already delivering the Clean Daily Herald for, Austin American Statesman had the same delivery route. And so I picked up three of their routes. I picked up a third route from Clean Daily Herald. My car was packed from top to bottom. Half of it was Clean Daily Herald. The other half was Austin American Statesman. At 16 years old, I was making between three and four grand a month delivering papers. You think I'm lying? When she met me, I had money, didn't I? There wasn't a buckle back then, thank God. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm doing that. Well, it's like, you know what? I, I, I got injured. That story of my son, it has a parallel story, okay? I got injured in high school, and so my career ended. And so I had a lot of extra time on my hands where I didn't need to be sitting around idle thinking about what I missed out on and what I was losing out on. And so I had a friend who worked at Darnell Army Hospital and said, hey, we need another person to come buff the floors and, and wax the floors. I'm like, all right, I'm your man. And so after school, we'd go and we'd take care of all the floors in the hospital. So I'm delivering papers in the morning from 3 a.m. to 7.30, and then I go to school. Get out of school, I go to Fort Hood, and I'm working in the hospital from about 6 to 10. Loved my work ethic. The boss came and said, hey, we also have a weekend and holiday job. Are you interested? Yes, I'm interested. So I delivered papers for two companies, and I worked two jobs as a contractor at Darnell. By the time I graduated, I was making almost six grand a month. Made then almost more than what I've ever made in my entire life in a month. When I met Becky, literally I had a Jack Daniels tin. I still have that Jack Daniels tin. It's empty today, but it used to have rolls of money in there. I say that to, just, to, just to let you know that the things that I wanted, I went earned. My mom and dad, my dad had just retired from the, from the army. My mom was working as a telephone operator. They weren't making a lot of money. She says, you know what? We don't have the money to buy, buy clothes, buy school clothes. We don't have the money to, to help you with lunch or any of that stuff. I said, that's fine. I got it. And she's like, what do you mean? I said, I got this. She says, whatever you have, give it to my brother and sister. I'll take care of all the extras for myself. What I'm telling you is a principle, again, you will hear me say this and have heard me say this, I'm telling you a principle that works. The last thing I'll share as part of this story, when I met Becky, I just thought that I was blessed. Sitting in church one time, I heard Pastor Sanders give a very similar talk about sowing and reaping, about giving. He said something that you can't outgive God. You want to bet? <laughs> and so I asked her, what is this, what is this tithe thing? What, is, what does it mean? And she would share, you know, you, you, you give out of obedience and worship. I go, I don't, want, I don't care about all the obedience and worship. So I want to know about the return, that, that 30, 60, 100 fold stuff. Tell me about that. That's what I wanted to know. And so uh, she said, 
The Bible says to test him. I said, oh, I'm going to test him, all right. <laughs> and so I started giving. Man, I gave my 10%, you know, $600.32. $327.41. Man, I was giving my 10%. I was giving it. You know what? I thought that I was, I was not going to have extra money. I thought my can was going to start to go down. The can never went down. The, mo- the money wasn't, wasn't leaving. It's like, okay, we go out. Man, I'm spending money. It's like, okay, I'm going to test you. And she's like, you're spending an awful lot of money. I said, Don't worry about it. God's got this. I'm not even a believer. You understand? I'm not even a believer. God's got this. Man, I'm, sp- I'm spending it as fast as I can spend it. I'm giving it as fast as I can give it. I said, all right, I'll fix you. I started giving more. Imagine that. I'm going to show God. <laughs> I started giving more. I started buying th- more things. I could not give it away fast enough. You know why? Because the more I gave away, the, more I, the harder that I worked to get. You see, it wasn't a, I'm going to give and give and give. It became such an exciting thing to give and to see that this testing God really works. I became a much better worker. And I actually got smarter. I hired my brother to deliver the newspapers. And I paid him a portion of what we would get, and I expanded his routes. So it took me three hours, was taking him five hours. Hey, it's called entrepreneurship. But now I could focus out on other things and earn, earn, earn money other ways. So the, the more I gave, the more I wanted to earn, the more I wanted to work. And it all started out because I wanted to show God up. When he says test him, he's serious. Test him and watch exactly what he will do. The financial app, the very first step in the financial app in eggs is earning. The other two will never happen if the first one doesn't become part of who we are in the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your, your, your time and your, your, your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your word that is deposited in us. Father, I, I pray that this becomes revelation, Lord, that you, you are looking for those who are obedient. You are looking for those who will not just hear your word, but be doers of your word. Lord, I just pray that this morning that we have heard the word. We've heard testimony of the word, Father God. And even in this room, Father, there are those who can testify to what I have testified to this morning. And Father, I just pray right now that as we sung this morning and as as I exhorted a little bit more, that we have a history, Father God, of not just overcoming overwhelming circumstances, but we have a history of earning and earning good living. We have a history, Father, of giving and giving abundantly what we earn. And we have a history, Father God, at some point in each and every one of our lives where we were putting money aside for the future. Father, I just declare this morning that we be reminded of that history. We be reminded of our testimony. And as we continue to walk through this lesson, Father God, I pray, Father, that you will encourage and you will reveal to each and every one of us of those moments, of those times when we overcame and we lived abundantly and we gave like we never gave before. We just thank you, Father. We we trust you. We love you this morning. Our spirit says this word is true. Help our thinking, Father God. Help our soul and our emotions to grab a hold of it and to begin to renew, refresh, and revive that word in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 A couple quick announcements as we, before you are dismissed, if it'll load. I just moved to the announcement. It's not coming up. Yep. All right. Just a reminder, if you are new here or if you are a guest, we want to welcome you. Um, If you did not get a a blue card to connect, uh, please see Wayne at the back. Make sure that you get one and put it into the offering envelope or offering basket. Uh, This Tuesday, we are having our second Real Talk from 6 to 7. 
We will start promptly at 6. If you have questions or if you want to know more information about all things Trinity, this is an opportunity to ask those questions, whether you're new to Trinity or whether you've been here for any length of time. Come and ask those questions. Just want to let you know the format is the brainstorming format. So we will take the first few minutes and we will brainstorm the ideas. Then the team will prioritize the ideas and we will start with the target of to get through the first three. If we get through all three, then we'll begin to continue down the list until the time is up. I want to, we will start at six and we will leave promptly at seven. So real talk this Tuesday at 6 p.m. Wednesday is, uh, did it come up? All right, nope. Wednesday is Tangible Kingdom. We will continue on that. We are in week six. Uh, I think we are 6.3. Yeah, 6.3, so try to read up to that and, and go through that. We'll, we'll discuss that. We've been discussing some things from last week. And then the last item that I have is this is 5th Wednesday. And so 5th Wednesday, um, if you have not been here on Wednesday nights, um, you may not understand what this is. But 5th Wednesday, we are going, looking at doing a missional community night. And what I am asking, particularly of the group that has been here on Wednesday, is that you consider hosting a party. That is Halloween night. And so we're going to dismiss our formal gathering. But I'm encouraging the team to come together with two families, no more than two families, and to plan hosting a party. And the party, your primary invitees are friends, neighbors, co-workers, people who do not attend church, but you have a relationship with. If you'd like to know more about that, come see us on Wednesday for Real Talk. You guys are dismissed. Have a great week. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we are collecting candy for Halloween for the block party. And so I, I think I saw a cooler out here. So if you brought your candy, you can place it in the cooler. If you have not, you can begin bringing it to every service and start placing it in the cooler. Chocolate.